Uh, if you want to follow up on any of the specific details, uh, all the peer reviewed stuff is here. There are some more kind of diverse uh, thoughts um, in this blog and um, you can always find me uh, at uh, michael.levin at tufts.edu. So um, I'd like to uh, con uh, convey the following main points today. First of all, I'm going to talk about the fact that our bodies operate in a multi-scale competency architecture, a kind of um, pr uh, problem solving intelligence at every level of organization. And I'm going to argue that definitive regenerative medicine is going to really require us to understand the collective intelligence of groups of cells and communicating goals to them uh, in this one of the spaces that they live in, which is anatomical morphous space. I'm going to specifically talk about a set of mechanisms which are endogenous bioelectrical networks, and they're becoming a, a highly tractable interface for top-down control of behavior of this collective intelligence. The tools are now coming online to read and write pattern memories specifically into this protocognitive medium. And I'm going to show you some applications in birth defects, regenerative repair, and cancer, but also uh, because uh, we're going to focus on some, some bioengineering here, talk about how we go beyond the standard traditional forms. And to really be able to heal, restore, and make new kinds of uh, living structures, we have to understand the agential material that we're working with. Now, across the spectrum of different types of materials, people have been working for thousands of years with passive materials, and now we're getting into active matter and computational material and so on. And uh, the interesting thing about um, changing the type of material is that different techniques and technologies become appropriate, different strategies. So when you're dealing with a passive material, uh, the good news is that uh, everything stays where you put it. You basically uh, construct whatever you want to construct piece by piece, bottom up. Um, but uh, the bad news is that all of its functionality is on you. You as the engineer have to make the pieces do everything that you want this machine to do. Now, as we move rightward on the spectrum, we enter what we're gonna talk about here called agential materials. And these are materials with an agenda. And so you can think about building a tower out of Legos. And so the, the property there is that uh, as, you, uh, as you construct a tower out of these Legos, it's, it's, it's quite easy to do, except that if it falls over, that's it, that's the end. You might think about constructing a tower out of dogs. And what's different there is that they're not going to stay where you put them if you use the technologies and approaches uh, amenable to um, uh, appropriate for a kind of passive material, right? They're not, not gonna stay there, but they, but they do offer an interesting interface, which is learning. And if you train them to stay like this, then you gain something different, which is that if you knock the tower over, it's self-healing, they will get right back up. And so, uh, the idea there is that uh, you need to use the appropriate uh, kind of approach to the level of uh, agency of your medium. And so this uh, uh, ends up being a discussion that a lot of people have about machines versus organisms. And so are, is, is your body a machine? Is it more than a machine? And so on. And what I want to transmit is this idea of uh, context-dependent, observer-dependent fluidity and how we think about these things. So if you, if you have an orthopedic surgeon, you definitely want that orthopedic surgeon to think of your body as a machine because they're going to use the appropriate tools, you know, chisels and hammers and things like that, right? But then, but then they send the patient home to heal. And when that patient heals, there's all kinds of stuff going on uh, to get from here to here that actually isn't captured by this paradigm at all. And if there's any kind of a psychological component to this, uh, to whatever, um, to whatever happened to that patient, you, you definitely don't want a psychotherapist that thinks of, of the patient as this kind of machine. So, so there are multiple levels and multiple uh, different approaches. And some of the most interesting work is done by people like Fabrizio Benedetti, who says uh, he, he works on uh, placebo effects, and, and we'll get to this by the end of, um, by the end of the talk, uh, words and drugs have the same mechanism of action. And this is incredibly deep, it, it really gets to the bottom of what the what the living organism actually is as a multi-scale system that spans a high level cognitive content all the way down to the movement of molecules wow. across cells. So um, what you can think about is uh, this idea that all these different kinds of this, this spectrum of, of all different kinds of systems uh, can be placed on what I call an axis of persuadability. This is uh, a way to uh, think about um, all of these different systems from the perspective of the engineer to ask, what are the kinds of tools? What are the approaches that I can use for all of these kinds of systems? So back here, when you have simple machines, well, the hardware modification is the only game in town. You're not going to convince it of anything. You're not going to reward or punish it. You have to be rewiring the hardware. And then you get into some cybernetic approaches with things that have little tiny goals. So homeostats and thermostats and things like that. And then there are some interesting systems um, 
which, uh, which allow uh, learning different kinds of training. Um, and then of course we have the human level and whatever is beyond that as far as uh, metacognition and things like that. And so uh, one question that we have to ask is where do groups of cells fit into this kind of spectrum? In other words, uh, if we are bioengineers and we're interested in understanding our material, do we have to assume, as many people assume, that, th that it lives somewhere down here and so hardware rewiring is really um, the way to go? Or might we find that there's actually some tools from these other disciplines that are amenable to this? And, and this is really critical because a lot of people treat this as a philosophical problem, as in, well, those are just cells. They don't have memories or they can't have goals or you know, people say stuff like that. But, but I, I want to emphasize that this is an empirical question. This is not a, you can't decide these things by armchair um, commitments to philosophical views. You have to do experiments. And that means uh, uh, taking some, some tools and concepts from, from other disciplines that are appropriate up here and asking the question, what, what, what kind of uh, uh, new uh, purchase on control and prediction and construction and, and invention and um, novel, um, novel capabilities does that give us with our cellular material? Okay, so, so the thing is that uh, developmental biology is really critical for, for all of these things because it teaches us something very profound that, that, that physics uh, becomes mind slowly and gradually. All of us at one point were an unfertilized oocyte, a simple, um, uh, a, a simple cell, a, a little bag of, of chemicals, which people could could look at and say, okay, well, this is clearly uh, amenable to the laws of um, to the to the uh, kind of uh, tools of chemistry and physics. Uh, but there's no there's no mind there. It's just it's just chemistry. But uh, eventually, we become something like this, or even something like this. And what's what's critical about developmental biology is that it offers no sharp dividing line where you say, ah, that's what the, there it is. That's when we went from from chemistry to mind. This is a slow, gradual process. So the self assembly of the body and the self assembly and the scale up of cognition is actually actually happen together. Um, and, uh, and, and this is what we need to understand if we're going to understand uh, what, what uh, cognitive processes are going on here and what might be their earlier, both evolutionarily and developmentally, what might be their earlier antecedents that we can take advantage of for engineering. So this is the kind of stuff we're made of. This is, this is what our what our cells are like this. Well, this happens to be a lacrimaria. It's a free living organism, but, but you get the idea that there's no brain. There's no nervous system. There are no stem cells. This is one cell. And, and this creature is handling all of its physiological, metabolic, behavioral um, needs all in one cell. It's highly competent in the little tiny goals that this thing has about its other state of affairs uh, around this little, little radius. And when we engineer with these kind of materials, and you can see there's a lot more um, detail here, what what you what you are able to do is is take advantage of an incredible toolkit that um, evolution has been preparing for over a billion years of all of these kinds of uh, competencies that otherwise you as the engineer would have to bake in yourself. When you're dealing with cells, they already do sensing, amplification, uh, signal discrimination, they do learning, they do decision-making and so on. They solve new problems. All of this is there for you in the material. Uh, it's not just at the level of individual cells, even below the cell level, something as simple as a gene regulatory network or a pathway, a set of molecules that interact with each other uh, can do uh, several different kinds of learning, including habituation, sensitization, uh, associative conditioning, so, so Pavlovian you know, kinds of learning. Um, all of that is present long before you get to a cell and certainly long before you get to a neuron or a brain or anything like that. So, so what I'm going to do next is... Um, try to uh, uh, show you some of the competencies of the medium just to you know give you a few a few facts that uh, you may not have uh, may not have seen uh, in your uh, biology so far and so you can start to get a feel for this amazing uh, material that uh, that we're working in so the first the first thing I'll show you is is this tadpole so so there are no eyes so so here are the nostrils the mouth the the, uh, the brain the spinal cord and the gut back here so this is a tadpole and what you'll see is that we prevented the primary eyes from forming but uh, we uh, made an eye appear on its back. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And it turns out that these animals, if you uh, test them, we made this machine to automate the behavioral uh, testing of, um, uh, of, of small, small model systems with light cues. What you find out is that these animals can see quite well. And uh, if, you, if you look where the optic nerve is, well, this eye does make a single optic nerve. It goes out. It doesn't go to the brain. It uh, synapses on the spinal cord here. And these animals can see. And so you don't need additional generations of evolution. You don't need um, selection. Uh, just just that, that in, in one generation, by radically changing the sensory motor architecture, 
uh, it, it's, it's, it's fine. The brain can recognize the information coming in here on this weird itchy patch of tissue on its back as visual data. They, they can learn in, in uh, visual cues and so on. The plasticity is, is amazing. And uh, that gets even, uh, even, even more incredible when you think about some other model systems. These are planarium, so these are flatworms. One of the cool things about flatworms is that uh, they regenerate their bodies. So they regenerate from any fragments that you cut. The record is something like 275 pieces. Um, they are also immortal, um, re really interesting organism. But, but what you can do is you can train them. And uh, if you train them and then cut off their heads, which contains their brain, the tail will sit there uh, doing nothing until they regrow a new head. And when they regrow a new head and behavior resumes, you find out that they remember the original information. So that leads, uh, to ask, uh, leads us to ask a couple of interesting questions. Where is the information during, during this, this regenerative process when all you've got is a, is a tail? And the next question is, how is that information imprinted onto the new brain as it develops? So you might think about um, applications in, in human medicine where in, in, in a few years, uh, patients with six, seven, eight decades of uh, memories, personality, and so on uh, have to have uh, portions of their brain replaced with a progeny of naive stem cells. So and some kind of degenerative brain uh, therapeutics. Uh, what's going to happen to those to that patient? What what what's going to happen to their cognition, their memories, and so on? But 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 here you see the the interface between the memories of the body, right? So so the morphogenetic memory that enables you to regenerate the same pattern, and the uh, the behavioral memory that uh, of events in three dimensional space, and how those two things come together. To me, one of the most interesting cases is this. This is a caterpillar. These guys are, you can think of them as a kind of soft bodied robot. They have no hard elements. So the controller here is this, this brain suited for driving that type of uh, embodiment. They live in a two dimensional world. They, they crawl around and they, and they um, eat leaves. But they have to become this. This is a hard bodied flying kind of thing, which lives in a three dimensional world. Uh, and it has a very different brain. And, and during metamorphosis, the brain is basically dissolved. It is, uh, most of the cells are killed off, but the memories remain. So if you train the caterpillar by, by giving it leaves on a particular color, um, in a particular color disc, the butterfly will remember the, that, that fact. Now, the most amazing thing here is that butterflies don't eat the same things that caterpillars do. So caterpillars eat leaves, the butterfly doesn't care about leaves, it likes nectar. And so that means that during this process, not only do you have to store information despite the drastic refactoring of the medium, which is you know, the, the, the brain and, and, and the central nervous system, but you also have to remap and generalize from finding leaves to finding a global category called food. And whatever that food is to you now, that is what you're going to remember. So, so it's really interesting to see how how specific memories are generalized and then imprinted onto a new physical architecture in a way that preserves their salience, right? Now, now that information you learned in this life, you have a different life in a different body, but, and, and you don't have the details of the information, but you have the generalized lessons that you've learned from there. Um, and, and this is, I mean, we don't have even the beginnings of an understanding of how all that actually works, uh, but it has implications for uh, human augmentation, new embodiments through, um, through uh, you know, kind of cyborg architectures and, and things like that. So the reason that, that we have these amazing capacities in the living world is that uh, all living beings are made of a, a kind of a, a, a nested multi-scale competency architecture where it's not just structurally that you're made of organs, which are made of tissues and cells and so on, but at, at, at every level of organization, these structures are solving problems. Each of them have little agendas in different spaces, different uh, scales of problems, and they're all very good at solving these problems. And that this is this this architecture is responsible for for a lot of the magic that we can take advantage of as bioengineers. Now, <clears throat> uh, when I talk about problem solving, we, we we have to realize that we as humans are pretty good, we're not great, but we're pretty good at recognizing intelligent behavior in three-dimensional space performed by medium-sized agents moving at medium speeds, right? Our, 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 our cognitive system is sort of primed for that. So we understand dogs and apes and birds and maybe an octopus or a whale. Uh, but there are all these other spaces in which uh, living things strive and, um, and navigate and suffer and uh, uh, have uh, successes and failures. There, is, uh, there are transcriptional spaces of all possible gene expressions, uh, physiological state spaces, and what we'll talk about most of all today, which is anatomical morphospace. space. So these things, these things are hard for us uh, as humans to, to, to recognize intelligence operating in these different spaces. But just imagine if we had evolved with a 
primary sense of your blood chemistry. If you could, if you could directly feel, let's say 20 different parameters, the way you do with taste and smell and so on. If you could directly feel um, your internal blood chemistry, I think we would have no trouble realizing that our liver and our kidneys were intelligent agents navigating uh, these spaces and solving problems uh, during the day and, and so on. Um, so let's talk about anatomical morphous space. How do collections of cells navigate that anatomical space? And I'm going to make the argument that quite, quite literally groups of cells are a collective intelligence uh, that navigates anatomical space. To understand why this is, let's consider this, this uh, scenario. So we all start life like this, a group of embryonic blastoderms and eventually, uh, blastomeres rather, and then eventually you have this cross section through a human torso. So now look at all the incredible complexity that's here, right? So, so all normal um, humans have this, this amazing order of everything is the right size and shape next to the right thing. Wh where does this pattern come from? So um, people often tend to say DNA, but of course we can read the genomes now. We know that none of this is directly in the DNA. What the DNA actually specifies is proteins, the micro level hardware that every cell gets to have. But all of this is the result of the physiological software that, um, that is performed by cells. So we really need to understand how do cell groups know what to make, when to stop, uh, in regenerative medicine, we'd like to know how to repair, how to convince them if a piece is missing, how do we convince these cells to, to, to build it again? And um, for today, we'll talk more about um, how far can we push this? As engineers, we'd like to know, actually, what's possible? What if you wanted these cells to build something completely different? Right? And so we, we understand now that this is, this is a problem of information. The, the, um, the structure of the body is not directly in the genome any more than the structure of the nest is laid out in the genome of the termites or the structure of the web is, is specified in the uh, genome of the spider. This, this is all um, physiologi physiological software that we need to understand. So, so in order to embark on this journey and figure out um, what, what, what this all means, I think it's, it's important to think about uh, the end game. So what, what, what are we trying to do here? What's the, what's the end of this field? When, when do we think we've succeeded and we can all go home? So I think that uh, you can think about this as, as, a, as a, something we call the anatomical compiler. So someday you will be able to sit down and draw at the level of the anatomy, not molecular pathways, but at the level of the anatomy, you'll be able to draw the animal, plant, um, biobot, or organ that you want, whatever, whatever it is. And what the system will do is compile that anatomical description into a set of stimuli that have to be given to those cells to build exactly that. In this case, this nice three-headed flatworm. Um, why do we need it? Well, besides the foundational issues of evolution and, 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 and computation and so on, this is an incre inc incredibly practical problem because if we had something like this, if we had a way to convince cells to build whatever we wanted them to build, birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, uh, uh, all of this, all of these problems would go away. Biorobotics would 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 take off. You know, this is this is central. Be our, our failure to communicate goals to to groups of cells is responsible for a huge part of the unmet need of biomedicine. Um, now, now, what's important is that this thing is not a 3D printer. It's not about putting individual cells where they go. It's a communications device. It's about translating our goals to that of the collective so that they can deploy their morphogenetic skills. Now, you might think, well, why don't we have this? Molecular biology and genetics have been going gangbusters for decades. Well, why don't we already have this? I just want to show you a, a, a simple example. Here's a, here's a baby axolotl. Baby axolotls have little four legs. Here's a frog a tadpole. They do not have uh, four legs at, the, at this stage. In my group, we make something called a frogolotl. So frogolotl is a bunch of embryonic uh, axolotl cells, a bunch of embryonic frog cells. They make a lovely chimeric embryo. Now, I tell you that we have the genome of the axolotl. It's been sequenced. We have the, gene, the genome of the frog. That's been sequenced. I give you those genomes and ask a simple question. Does, would the frogolotl have legs or not? Right? And, so, and so we don't even have the beginnings yet of a, uh, of a science to be able to figure that out from this kind of genomic data. And so, so here's where we are. Um, we're very good at manip manipulating molecules and cells. Uh, all the exciting approaches nowadays, uh, genome editing, CRISPR, stem cell biology, um, uh, uh, pathway rewiring, protein engineering, all of these kinds of things are 
down at the level of the hardware. But what we really don't understand at all and what we would like to control is anatomy. How do large scale collections of cells make decisions about what to build? And so I'm going to make the argument that biology today and biomedicine in particular is where computer science was in the 50s and 60s. All and this, this is how you did programming back then, right? You were, you were down at the level of the hardware and you had to interact with the hardware. But the reason that nowadays on your laptop, when you need to go from PowerPoint to Microsoft Excel, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring is because computer scientists perfected this um, remarkable uh, hierarchy uh, of, of tools to deal with software, to reprogram certain kinds of media. And I think this is what we're just beginning to realize in, in biology. And uh, we need to understand the intelligence and the reprogrammability of our medium. Now, I've used the word intelligence several times. What do I mean by it? Well, here's a, here's a definition I like. I like William James's definition. The ability to reach the same goal by different means. This is a uh, very nice cybernetic definition because it doesn't talk about what kind of brain you have. It doesn't specify what sort of sp uh, problem space you're operating in. It's, it's much more um, deep than that. It talks about uh, different levels of competency to reach specific goals when the system is stymied or deviated from that goal. Okay, so, so now let's ask. So for the next few minutes, let's talk about what kind of intelligence do cells de deploy? What, what problems do they solve? When I say that groups of cells are a collective intelligence, what do I mean? Here's, um, here's one example. And so this is a cross-section through the uh, kidney uh, tubule of a, uh, of a newt. And normally there's eight to 10 cells that work together to, um, to produce that. Now, one thing you can do with these animals is um, prevent uh, cell division at early stages, which means every cell ends up with multiple copies of its genome. You get polyploid newts to, uh, you know, 4N, 6N, 8N, things like that. And when that happens, the cells get bigger, but the newt stays the same size. And so if you were to look at the, at the cross section, what you see is that, that, that a, a smaller number of bigger cells are now involved. So, uh, so let, let's, let's recap. Um, you can still make a normal newt if you've got the wrong amount of DNA. Uh, if your cell size is incorrect, they will adjust. And then the most amazing part of all, which is that if you make absolutely gigantic cells, I think these are 5N or 6N newts, um, one cell will bend around itself and, uh, and still give you the same kind of structure. The reason that's remarkable is that this is cell-to-cell -cell communication. So this is normal tubular genesis. This is some sort of cytoskeletal bending. It's a different molecular mechanism. So think of what you have here, two, two, two key points. One is that this is downward causation in the sense that in the service of an anatomical goal, different molecular mechanisms are being called up. So your, your medium is good at finding the tools that it has to get the job done when things change. So there's that definition of intelligence. The other thing is just think about the problem that, that newts have coming into the world. Fundamentally, you don't know how many copies of your genome you're going to have. You don't know the size of your cells. You don't know how many cells you're going to have. You don't know any of that. You, you can't afford to take your evolutionary priors too seriously or, or overtrain on them, as, as um, machine learning folks like to say. Uh, you have to solve this problem from scratch. And I think that because of the prevalence of mutation and you, you can't, not, not only can you not um, count on your environment to be exactly the same as it was, you can't even count on your parts to be the same as they were. Your own components are not going to be the same because of mutation, evolutionary change. And then of course, environment throws a wrench into everything too. So, so what evolution actually makes is problem solving machines. You can't afford to, uh, to, to do the same thing every single time. Now, um, anatomical goals uh, in, uh, in morphous space means um, yes, this reliably, a single uh, human uh, egg reliably gives rise to a, uh, an anatomically normal human, but so do half embryos and quarter embryos and things like that. You, you, when, when you cut an early embryo into pieces, you don't get half bodies. You get perfectly normal monozygotic twins, triplets, quadruplets, and so on. That's because they can get to the same ensemble of states, this, this goal state in anatomical space corresponding to the normal human target morphology. You can get there from different starting positions and avoiding some, some local, um, local maxima. So, th so that, that type of navigation of space is, is really shocking. We, by the way, we don't have any machines that do this. We don't, we're, we're not good at making engineering that works like this. You know, we, we don't have anything that you can cut, it, cut into pieces and it still figures out what, the, what to do, rebuilds, and by the way, remaps old memories if you decide to change the structure the way that butterflies do. Um, that kind of process is not just for embryos. Some animals keep it throughout their lifetime. So here's your uh, axolotl. These guys regenerate their eyes, their jaws, their tails, including spinal cord, their limbs, um, their ovaries. And so if you, if you amputate, whether here or here or anywhere, it will immediately start to uh, grow and, and uh, morph and then eventually get eventually rebuild and then it stops. 
two, two amazing things. One is that it, it grows exactly what's needed from wherever you cut. So, so it only um, does what's, what's missing. And when does it stop? Well, it stops when the correct salamander arm has been completed. Now that's remarkable because that means it has to know where it's going. It has to know what the, what the, um, the end goal of their journey through anatomical space. And the reason it's a goal is not just because it's complex and it's sort of an outcome of, of a bunch of chemistry happening in parallel. It, uh, which, what you're seeing here is a, uh, a, a high level of effort and measured in the metabolic cost and so on, high level of effort to get back to the correct state when it has been deviated. Okay, from that state. Now, now I'll point out that it, this is not just about worms and salamanders. So human livers regenerate, um, human children regenerate their fingertips, um, and deer, large adult mammal, regenerate huge amounts of uh, of bone uh, innervation, vasculature, skin when they're regenerating their antlers, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. These guys make. Okay, so. And it's an interesting question why why we're generally not that that good at it, but so so just to remind us what what we're talking about um, this this kind of uh, uh, goal directed navigation in anatomical space looks something like this these these tadpoles have to become frogs so they have to so here's the eyes the mouth they, they have to rearrange all these organs to go from tadpole to frog and the null hypothesis has always been that well it's a hardwired process so each one of these organs just travels the right direction and the right at the right amount and then you get from a normal tadpole to a normal frog so we decided to test that like how much intelligence does this really have and so we created what's called picasso tadpoles so these are scrambled the eyes on the side of the head the mouth is off to the top the, every everything's just just scrambled and what you find is that these animals make quite normal frogs because all of these components will undergo novel motions and they won't stop until they get to the right place. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to double back, but eventually everything settles on the correct frog face. So the genetics actually does not give you hardware that uh, just, just moves things in a, in a uh, prescribed fashion. It actually gives you an error minimization scheme. It gives you a system that can uh, uh, try to minimize errors from a specific set point. So, um, that means that to the standard of view of developmental biology, which is, which is what you see in your textbooks, that you have some gene regulatory networks and then some, some, um, some proteins that interact via, via, via physics. And then there's this magical process of emergence, right? So, so eventually, if you, if you crank on these rules in parallel, eventually something complex will come out. And that's true. All, all of this is true. And there's plenty of ways to get emergent complexity, but that's not the whole story. In fact, I think that's not even the most interesting part of the story. What's, what's more important are these feedback loops which uh, will try to regain that target morphology when you try to deviate from it. And so this means, of course, injury, but also mutations and teratogens and, um, and, and various other ways to get away from this, uh, this kind of set point. And so, so thinking about this uh, suggests a couple of things. First of all, uh, of, of course, biologists know all about um, feedback loops and homeostasis and things like that. But, but typically we think about uh, scalars like uh, pH, temperature, hunger level, those kind of things, Sing single, single numbers. Here, the set point is going to have to be something complex, like an uh, like a, like a, a anatomical representation of the thing you're trying to build. How, how could we possibly store an, a, a goal state like this in tissue? How could tissue remember an anatomical or geometric pattern? So this, this really weird way of thinking about things which by the way, molecular biologists don't love because you're not supposed to talk about goals and, and, and things like that. You're supposed to talk about um, chemistry and chemical pathways. But, but, but this, you know, we should know that, that of, of course, since the 40s, we've had a mature science of uh, machines with goals. It's not scary or magical anymore. So we can, we can, um, we can think about these things now. And um, this way of, of thinking about it makes some, some strong predictions. It predicts that you actually should be able to find, decode, and then rewrite whatever mechanism is keeping this, uh, this set point, right? Because all homeostasis, homeostatic systems have to store some kind of set point. And it also predicts, that means that if you, uh, if you, if you are successful in rewriting that set point, you shouldn't have to uh, make changes down here, which is very difficult. You know, if you want to make, if you want to make system level changes, what genes do you change? Usually we have no idea because reversing this is extremely hard. It's a very hard inverse problem, but you should be able to just change the set point and then they'll build, the cells will do what they do best, which is build to it. But how could, how could a collection of cells possibly remember? And I use that word um, on purpose. How could a collection of cells remember what the correct state is going to be? Well, we know from neuroscience that actually certain collections of cells are very good at remembering goal states and trying to implement them intelligently. And that would be brains. So 
um, the way the way that system works is you have these electrical networks which use ion channels to set voltage gradients. They have electrical synapses um, that uh, spread information through the through the network, and that that hardware. Uh, supports all of the amazing software of cognition. So, so here's a zebrafish brain that this, uh, this group um, imaged, and it's the commitment of neuroscience through neural decoding, uh, the process, the, 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 the project, the research um, program of neural decoding, that if we just knew how to decode this physiology, we would be able to extract the memories, the preferences, the behavioral repertoire of this animal. So it turns out, so, so, that, so that's, 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 that means that in neuroscience, we have the beginnings of a, of a, of a science that links um, electrophysiology to uh, mental cognitive content, to, to goals, to um, various kinds of uh, intelligent problem solving activities. But it turns out that this is not unique to brains. Every cell in your body has ion channels. Most cells have electrical connections to their neighbors like this. And so uh, that means that what if we could, what if we could um, basically steal a bunch of techniques and approaches from neuroscience and apply them to other cells that also form electrical networks? That le leads to questions like early embryos. And so this is, um, this is voltage imaging that we develop, much like here, but instead of the brain, you're looking at the early frog embryo. What, what, do, what do cells think about uh, long before there are brains or muscles or, or, or movement in the 3D world. What is, what is this electrical network thinking about? And so this is, this is what we study. Uh, and we develop some tools. So the first tool, of course, is voltage imaging, just so you can characterize the information flow through the system. We do a lot of computational modeling. And so oh, and we, we do this by voltage-sensitive fluorescent dyes, typically, or sometimes genetically encoded voltage reporters. Um, we do a lot of computational modeling to try to understand uh, these uh, and predict these dynamics. Let me show you um, two patterns that, uh, that are particularly interesting. One is that we, we call this the electric face. So this is a time-lapse video of a frog embryo putting its face together. The brightness corresponds to voltage, to uh, resting potential. And this is one frame out of that video. And what you see is that basically the future structure of the face is already laid out in the electrical properties of that um, ectoderm. So here's where the eye is going to be, here's where the mouth is going to be, here are the placodes, the animal's left eye comes in, comes in slightly later. So, so this, this pattern is a, a, a necessary part of normal development because if we change this pattern, the gene expression that is required to pattern the face and the ultimate anatomy, those are all um, altered. So this is, this is, this, this, uh, this the, the, the bioelectric code here is, is, is literally showing you where uh, all the different uh, region, regions of the face are going to be. Now, so that's a normal pattern. This is a pathological pattern that we see when we inject human oncogenes into tadpoles. Eventually they'll make a tumor and that tumor, um, and then it has a bunch of metastases here, but you can already see these cells long before this is visible. You can already see these and you know where it's gonna happen by looking at where the cells are disconnecting from their neighbors and acquiring a, um, an abnormal voltage potential. And at that point, they just think of themselves as amoebas and the rest of the body is just external environment and, and they go where they want and they eat what they want and you get metastasis. Now, this is the, so, so these are techniques for monitoring this, these bioelectrical states, but now we've also uh, developed techniques to uh, write information back into them. We do not use electrodes. We do not use electromagnetic radiation. There are no fields. There are no um, waves. There are no magnets. Uh, all of this is done by manipulating the external interface, the bioelectric interface that cells normally use to hack each other. And that means ion channels on their surface to set voltage state and gap junctions, these electrical, um, electrical synapses to convey that voltage state to the neighbors in the network. So we can use all the stuff that um, neuroscience is used. So um, we can use uh, various ion channel and gap junction modifying drugs. We can mutate them genetically. We can do optogenetics and use light and so on. So what happens when you do this? What 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 uh, what 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 does this electrical information in the body? What is it used for? Let's 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 modify it and see what happens. So that's that's the that's uh, what we started to do when we first developed some of these tools to to use these molecular reagents to control the bioelectrical state of these networks. I'm just going to show you a couple of a uh, couple of examples that I like. Um, this is uh, this is one where what we can do is uh, we can we can use uh, uh, RNA encoding certain potassium channels to express it in early cells and to induce the kind of uh, voltage pattern that you saw in the eye spot of that electric face. When you do that, you find out that what you've done is told these cells to make an eye, but you can do that anywhere. That is the information the cells use to decide what they should be. And if you tell a bunch of gut cells that they should be an eye, well, that's what they make. And so 
so we can make we can make these eyes anywhere in the animal. They have all the right lens, right? And the optic nerve, they have all that stuff. And so, so from this, we learn a couple of things. First of all, that the bioelectric pattern is instructive. Okay, it, it's not just a matter of well, we screwed up some voltage and then the animals is, is is sick and doesn't make the right tissues. No, it's actually instructive. You can make an entire um, new organ by telling it what to do. Then we find out that that information is quite modular. So we didn't give it a lot of a lot of uh, details. Um, in fact, we didn't say how to make an eye. We have no idea how to make an eye. What we've told it was a very simple signal, which is a basically a uh, high level subroutine call that says make an eye here. Everything else is handled by the material. This is back to this concept of, of the competency of your material. The material already knows how to make an eye, but what you need to figure out is how to convince it that that's the path that it should be following. Um, we also find that uh, if you prompt, and this will become important in, in a few minutes, if you prompt it with the right signals, you can, uh, you can actually get it to do things that normally it won't do. So in your text, in your developmental biology textbook, it'll say that uh, the cells behind this anterior ectoderm are actually incompetent to form eye. And that's because it was probed with the so-called master eye gene called PAC6. And in fact, if you do that, yes, you don't get eyes past this. But if you use the right uh, prompt, which is this bioelectrical signal, then no, they, of course they're competent. You can, you can get this anywhere in the body. So that reminds us to be humble about um, what are the competencies of the tissue. If you, if you don't know what your material does, that may be a limitation of the material, or it may be a limitation of us and our understanding. So assigning uh, intelligence to, to materials is basically us taking an IQ test ourselves in terms of what do we understand about how this, how this works. And the other cool thing about it is that um, if you only, so, so this is a lens sitting out in the flank somewhere. If you only get a few cells, the blue ones are the ones we injected, uh, it, they will actually recruit their neighbors. So all of this other stuff here was never modified by us. They actually recruit their neighbors to help them finish the task. We didn't teach them to do that. They already do that. Like many other collective intelligences like ants and termites who, you know, if a couple of ants find something interesting and they can't uh, carry it to the nest, they'll recruit their, uh, their, their, uh, their buddies to, to, to help them out. The cells do the same thing here. Um, this is another kind of uh, application where we looked at limb regeneration. So frogs, unlike salamanders, do not regenerate the, their limbs at certain stages. Uh, here it is, we amputate 45 days later, there's nothing, but we were able to come up with a cocktail that after a, uh, after a very brief uh, sti stimulus, uh, then triggers the whole, so, so here's MSX1, pro-regenerative kind of marker. Yeah, by 45 days, you've already got some toes, you've got a toenail, and eventually a pretty respectable looking leg that is touch sensitive and motile. The latest work on this, 24-hour um, stimulation uh, leads to a year and a half of leg growth. We don't touch it during that time at all. This is not about micromanagement. This is not about controlling uh, gene expression or where the cells go. This is about convincing the cells right at the beginning that... Um, they, uh, that they need to go down to the, uh, down the regeneration path, not the scarring path. Uh, and, and then after that, the system takes care of it. So we are, um, mm. of course, um, now trying to uh, move this into mammals. And so I have to do a disclosure here because David Kaplan and I have this uh, company called Morphoceuticals Inc., where we are trying to push that technology using wearable bioreactors, which David's lab uh, builds to, uh, to mice and hopefully eventually to the clinic. Um, and so, so the goal here is to develop a computational pipeline that goes all the way from the beginning of understanding, well, which channels are even expressed in my cells down to understanding the bioelectrical tissue dynamics, uh, large scale kinds of uh, anatomical decision-making, and eventually a computational uh, and algorithmic description of how different regions decide their shape and size, which makes it much easier to then make changes. So we want, we want a, like a full stack simulator where we can understand this. And, and, and we're only at the very early stages of this, but one thing that we can already do is um, make uh, repairs in a quite complex organs. So this is a normal uh, tadpole brain. Here's a completely uh, disorganized brain induced by a, a dominant notch mutation. So you can see the forebrain is basically gone, the midbrain, a hindbrain, or a bubble. They have no behavior. They're um, just a, you know, very, very, uh, very drastic defects. But um, we had a computational uh, model that told us that actually it, we, we could uh, open certain channels to reinforce the endogenous bioelectrical pre-pattern that tells cells how to make a normal brain. And if you do this, despite the notch mutation being there, and the notch is a very important neurogenesis gene, but despite that, you can, uh, and it happens to be this HCN2 ion channel, if you, if you uh, activate these channels or misexpress some of these channels, 
you get back a normal brain. So uh, not, not only normal structurally and, and molecularly, but actually their behavior is normal. Their IQ um, comes back to normal, indistinguishable from controls. So in some cases, and I'm not saying this is always going to be the case, but in some cases, you can fix certain um, hardware defects. I mean, this notch mutant is a hardware defect. You can, you can fix some hardware problems in software if you have the computational um, a platform that, that, can, that can show you how to do that. So what we are working on is this notion that, that at some point there's going to be a workflow like this where uh, you start with an with a incorrect bioelectrical state, say a tumor. You already have a database of physiomic data, so that doesn't exist yet. We're, we're working hard to, um, to, to start to generate some of that data uh, that tells you what the, what the correct state is for that tissue or organ. And then um, the simulator would be able to say, well, these are the ion channels you need to open or close to convert the incorrect state to the correct state. And then, of course, you, you go and you look for drugs and something like 20 percent of all drugs are ion channel drugs. And so this is a huge platform of um, electroceuticals out there that um, could be potentially uh, repurposed for these kind of uh, bioelectric uh, interventions. If we uh, if we had a system for um, for choosing them and and so you can you can start to start to play with that there, um, okay and so so all of this so far has been about how do we get back to normal so injury uh, birth defects cancer how do we how do we get back to normal but um, I want as 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 engineers I want to start thinking uh, beyond that and one interesting fact is that development is very deceiving so. Uh, when you, it, it's deceiving because it is so reliable because it, because it works so well most of the time. And when you look at an acorn and you know that all of the time, uh, the, the acorns develop into uh, uh, trees and, uh, this is you. You get you get the feeling that uh, that what the what the uh, oak genome has learned to do is to make these things nice, flat, green, um, same same kind of patterns all the time. But in fact, um, turns out humans are not the only bioengineers. And there's uh, there's there's this little guy. These these wasps that lay embryos. Um, they lay eggs on these leaves. And what they're able to do is to hack the surrounding cells to build something like this. This is a gall. These galls have, have this amazing kind of complex structure. There are lots of different, um, lots of different kinds of galls. And so what you find out is that first of all, uh, the, this idea that what the genome only knows how to do is this is wrong. Actually, it knows how to do something very different. Instead of flat green, uh, it makes these round uh, red uh, spiky things. Um, that re that leads us to the realization that were it not for this wasp, we would have no idea what these cells are capable of, right? We would never, I mean, nobody would ever guess that these same cells with that same exact genome, right? there's no, there's no genomic modification here with the same genome that it knows how to do this. The, 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 the ability of that hardware to, to go there is, uh, we, we wouldn't know that. What, and, and that leads to the question of what else is possible, right? So, so, so if we understood, um, uh, the bioprompting a little better, what else could we make these cells do? And, uh, and, and this idea that, that uh, evolution uses this kind of uh, hacking universally, it's all over the place. Uh, this is, this is uh, you know, it's not, it's not micromanaging um, the, uh, the genome. It is, uh, it is in fact uh, exploiting the, uh, the, the competencies of um, the, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's exploiting the competencies of the material. So one of the things that uh, the material is um, quite good at is scaling up its goals. So, so again, let's let's remember that uh, individual cells have little tiny goals. I mean, the thing, the states that they're working towards are physiological, metabolic uh, things, things on the scale of a single cell, both in time and space. And um, uh, what what evolution and uh, development allow them to do is to join together large goals in anatomical space. But that process has a failure mode. That failure mode is cancer, and so you can see here um, when individual cells disconnect from this uh, from this electrical network, they basically treat the rest of the body as external environment, then they roll back to their ancient uh, unicellular kinds of behaviors. They're they're not more selfish. Cancer cells are not more selfish than regular cells. Their cells are smaller, <laughs> so you can see this. Um, you can see this kind of uh, 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 inflation and scaling of the boundary between self and world, and so that leads to an interesting uh, strategy that we can use, which is uh, when we, when uh, an anti-cancer approach, which is let's, um, could we, uh, could we actually uh, reconnect? We force the reconnection of cells to the rest of the, uh, the, um, the body. And uh, so, so here's this experiment. We induce uh, a nasty human oncogene, KRAS mutation or, or something like that. Uh, typically they'll make a tumor. And in fact, this is the same animal here. Um, the exact, the, the, cell, the, the cells are very strongly expressing the oncogene, but 
there's no tumor. And that's because we uh, also expressed a particular ion channel that forces these cells, despite what the oncogene is trying to tell them, it forces these cells to uh, remain electrically connected to their neighbors and hooked into the, to the pattern memory that we should be building nice skin, the muscle, um, you know, little kidney and so on, as opposed to going off and being amoebas. And so, and so this interplay between the, the collective goals and the individual goals allows us to start asking questions about how do we reset those goals and where do they come from in the first place? And you might think that where they come from in the first place has to be evolution. I mean, evolution uh, over, over the eons has set these goals. So um, in the last, um, a little bit of, of the talk, what I want to discuss is uh, some synthetic systems where uh, that, are, that are beginning to show us that, that things are not so simple. So um, I want to introduce you to uh, this thing, uh, which are called Xenobots. And what uh, we started doing was to take some uh, early ec uh, ectodermal cells off of a, off of a frog embryo, um, liberate them, and put them in a petri dish. Now, they could do a number of things. They could die they could spread out and sort of walk away from each other. They could form a nice uh, two-dimensional monolayer. What they do instead is they sort of uh, coalesce together into this, uh, into this little, little kind of uh, organoid looking thing. And then they start to move. And so they start to swim around because they have little cilia, they have little hairs on their surface that um, uh, is normally used in, by, by frogs and tadpoles to uh, move mucus down their, um, down their bodies. But, but in this configuration, they can use it to swim. They row uh, against the water and they swim. And so they can go in circles and they can patrol back and forth like this. And they can have you know, sort of collective behaviors. Um, we, we call them Xenobots because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog. And we think they're a biorobotics uh, platform. So Xenobots. Here's, here's a Xenobot um, doing a maze. So, so watch, watch what happens. So it, so it swims down here. At this point, it takes the corner without having to bump into the opposite wall. And then at this point, for some, due to some internal dynamics we don't understand, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. So they have, they have autonomous, we're not pacing it, we're not controlling it. It, it has autonomous swimming behavior. Um, in fact, lots of really interesting behaviors. Uh, they have, uh, this is, this is uh, we're visualizing calcium signaling. So we can use all the tools that people use to analyze uh, electrical activity in brains, information theory, and so on. But there are no neurons here. These are just basically uh, epithelial cells. Uh, but 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 they have lots of interesting computations going on that can be read out through this calcium. Um, they are uh, they self repair. So if you cut them in half, they generate. Uh, look at all the force that it had to generate through that through that hinge to to fold to fold this thing up like that, right? So they go back to their um, xenobot form. If you give them a bunch of loose uh, skin cells here, what they will do is uh, they will they will both both independently and in groups they will work together. Uh, to uh, uh, collapse them into these little, uh, little, little piles, and they sort of polish the little piles. And because they're working with an agential material too, just like we were when we made the Xenobots, these little piles become the next generation of bots. And guess what they do? They mature and they go on and they do exactly the same thing. And so you have, you have a kinematic replication, right? They're, they're making copies of themselves from stuff they find in the environment. This is von Neumann's dream, a robot that finds materials and makes copies of itself. So uh, that leads to an interesting engineering question, which is, uh, so, so what, did, what did the hardware learn during evolution? I mean, here's the, the Xenopus genome. Typically, it goes through a very stereotypical uh, set of steps. So, so here, you know, here's embryogenesis, and then eventually you get tadpoles with this behavior. But these cells uh, that can also do this, they can make Xenobots with its own weird uh, developmental um, kind of progression. They have different behaviors. And so, so, so this is really important. Uh, there's never been any xenobots. There's never been any selection to be a good xenobot. Where does this come from? Where do these um, behaviors and, and, and capabilities uh, come from? And so, so, so here we, we once again remember that um, it is not just about selection. It is, is, it is about the fact that evolution makes some very reprogrammable, very uh, competent problem-solving hardware that in novel configurations can do different things. I mean, we didn't do any, we didn't give the cells any new genes, no weird nanomaterials. All we did was liberate them from the rest of the body. And so what you see is that their normal behavior here is the result of them being hacked by these other cells to uh, serve certain purpose and have a boring two-dimensional life on the outside of the, uh, of the animal being a barrier to pathogens and so on. But, but liberated from all that, they have a completely different uh, type of um, 
type of existence. And so, and so uh, being able to look at your material through its point of view and ask who, who's, who's hacking whom with what and how much is a really critical part of your toolkit going forward, I think. And so um, next generation bioengineering and biomedicine is going to be using uh, tools of AI and, and tools from other disciplines, neuroscience beyond neurons, to um, really sort of play along this whole uh, uh, this, this, this whole um, uh, axis of, uh, of, of complexity and, and cognition all the way up from, from, from uh, kind of uh, cognitive uh, kinds of things and you know, conscious ones, for example, like in Benedetti's study where, where people are told they're given a particular a neuroactive compound and then they, they, their, their brain chemistry actually sh shows the effects of that compound, even though all they got was placebo. So, so this idea that uh, what we're going to be doing is really taking advantage of the information processing, the memories, the, the competencies of the different levels of the medium. And um, one, one other idea that, that, uh, that is relevant here, relevant here is the, the notion of having a kind of impedance match between the technique that you're using, the intervention, and the target that you're reprogramming. Okay, so so up till now, we mostly, you know, we use we use drugs, we use uh, the various materials, and those are those are pretty low agency interventions. But um, could we uh, could we design higher agency interventions to really match the agency of the material that we're trying to deal with? Could we make? I mean, we we people think about smart implants and and, and things like that. But um, I just want to show you uh, what I think of uh, as, uh, as, a, as a, a really promising platform in the future. And this is uh, towards personalized agential interventions. So uh, here it is, this, this little thing is swimming around. And if I were to show this to you and ask you what this is, you might think that this is some sort of a primitive animal we got from the bottom of a pond somewhere. But if you sequence the genome, you find something interesting, 100% homo sapiens. Okay, these are these are human cells, and this is an anthrobot. So the way it's it's like the xenobot, but it comes from human patients. Um, this is this is what it looks like. Uh, the basically they come from uh, tracheal um, human tracheal epithelium donated by adult patients during biopsies and things like that. We have a, a particular path for them, a protocol in which they uh, also become ciliated on the outside, just like our our xenobots, and then they undergo all kinds of interesting behaviors. So here's here's one. Uh, what it's doing is it's it's uh, traversing this this scratch that we made this stuff out here is um ips derived human neural cells so this this lawn of neurons we put a scratch through it so this is like a wound um, assay where you basically you basically ask what happens if you if you damage a bunch of these nerves and so you you saw that uh, that uh, anthrobot navigate if if they if a bunch of them settle into this gap so here we call this a a super bot or a bridge bot uh and this is uh this is something that uh uh, we recently found that uh, if you if if you if you leave them there for about four days, what they're actually start to do is to knit together the sides of the gap. They start to repair this wound in the neural tissue. Here's what it looks like once you've once you've lifted up the uh, the bot. And so this is uh, this is actually a PhD student in my group, uh, Gizem Gomushkaya, who uh, uh, did uh, the, all this uh, all this anthrobot work. Um, and and so just to, just imagine, right in in the future. Uh, your own body cells, no transgenes, no 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 gene therapy, uh, are are can be deployed to to help repairs. Who would have known that your tracheal cells that sit there quietly for decades are actually able to form a little biobot that moves around on its own, and you're actually really addicted to actually that. heals um, neural wounds. And, then, uh, and uh, what other kinds of uh, uh, capabilities do they have? We don't know. This is the first thing we tried, right? So 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 they 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 probably have all kinds of other competencies. And then of course there's issues of well, can we train them? Now, can we uh, can we make them smarter in in various ways and and so on. So. Um, I, and, and, and they don't require any kind of immune suppression because they're made of your own cells and they share with you the priors about what health and disease is, which, which uh, um, you know, no, um, lo low agency interventions like drugs and, and implants uh, are not going to have that. So this is, this is what I think of as the, as the landscape for biomedicine going forward. It, this is all the familiar bottom up kind of tools that we have today. Um, but uh, complementing them is this whole developing area of top-down interventions, including behavior shaping, which we didn't even talk about as far as um, training cells and tissues, and then using agential implants and things like that. And uh, the various uh, morphoceuticals, including electroceuticals, which are being used to rewire uh, the uh, not, not the hardware, but actually to change their behavioral landscape. So the idea is that um, you're not micromanaging their, their molecular state. What you're doing is targeting 
their decision making, their memories, their set points, uh, their beliefs of, of uh, literally the models they make of their microenvironment based on uh, past experience, the responses, you know, are they going to fight you on the things that you want them to do and so on. So um, I think I think what's going to happen, and you can you can see the details all all here. But I think I think uh, the diverse intelligence community, which are the people who work on um, understanding problem solving and intelligence in really um, unconventional substrates, have a lot to say to biomedical engineers and regenerative medicine workers. I think um, these two fields need to come together in an important way. And I think the medicine of the future is really going to be much more like a kind of uh, somatic psychiatry, less like chemistry. And bioelectricity is at least one, there may be others, but it's at least one interface that really enables us to uh, to, to, to exploit the mind of the body. So if you want to go deeper, um, a lot of the uh, kind of more, more general, more philosophical stuff is in, is in these papers. Um, I want to thank all the people who did the work. So, uh, so the grad students and the postdocs who did all the things I showed you today. Um, lots of collaborators, um, our funders, of course, um, three disclosures. So here are three companies that have supported some of the work that I've shown you today. Um, Jeremy Gay is the amazing graphic artist who makes our, all our illustrations. And um, most of all, um, the model systems, because they have the hardest job of all and um, to, to, to teach us about all these amazing things. So thank you so much. And I will take questions.